Welcome to the Engineering Influence Podcast sponsored by the ACC Life Health Trust. With us today is Richard Branch, Chief Economist for the Dodge Data and Analytics Group. A couple weeks ago, Richard released Dodge's 2021 Economic and Construction Market Forecast, and he's joined us to delve into the numbers. Richard, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Great to be here. So to start, can you give us a broad sense of what the engineering industry can expect in 2021? Yeah, sure. I, I think the simplest thing to say is, is that we do expect construction activity to improve next year. We do expect it to grow. Um, but at that pace is going, that pace of growth is going to be fairly modest. It's going to be fairly moderate. Uh, of course, given everything that the industry and, and we as individuals have been through in, in 2020, uh, that is, is certainly good news. Um, but we need to keep in mind here that there are significant headwinds at play as we move into 2021 uh, that makes this recovery, I'll say, much more tenuous. And uh, in your forecast, you mentioned several times that it depends on the uh, widespread adoption of a vaccine by, mid, by the middle of the year and passage of a substantial stimulus package in the range of like 1.5 trillion in the first quarter of the year. Have you ever had a forecast that faced such stark deal breakers and, and how stark are they? This is pretty unique, I'll say that. I, I think the closest parallel that I can think of is if we go back to 2009 during the Great Recession, and as Congress was weighing um, passage of the ERA Act, the, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, um, you know, if we think back to that time, it, it passed both the House and the Senate pretty much along party lines. Uh, but getting it to that point, it was, you know, it was touch and go. Um, and, and it was unclear right up until the, the last couple of days of how much sacrifice would need to be made in terms of the overall amount in the era of funding. Um, in order to get the support that it needed to get through Congress. It obviously ended up passing and, and it had a tremendous positive influence on the economy in, in the wake of passage. So now we've got not only the, the uncertainty regarding passage of, of further fiscal stimulus now, uh, but I would offer it, it, it's happening in a much more uh, sensitive political environment. Uh, we're, we're currently in a transition period between two administrations and, and in between two Congresses, because um, there will be changes in the House and the Senate uh, a, as well. But then we need to layer on top of that um, when we can expect not just the vaccine to be ready, but when we see it widespread, uh, adopted widespread across the, the country. And of course, you know, there's been a lot of good news recently um, regard, with regards to efficacy rates of, of the vaccines as they make their way through trials. So that's certainly good news. And I think at least that knowledge does or should provide a good sense of stability in, in terms of the underpinning of the forecast. And uh, what are your thoughts on that stimulus package? Do you, do you see that actually going through in the first part of the year? Sure, so we had in our forecast, we had assumed that $1.5 trillion to be adopted in the first quarter. And we were using that 1.5 trillion as, as I'll, I'll call it a median. You know, it could have been a little bit higher, could have been a, bit, a little bit lower, depending upon how, what that final makeup uh, of Congress was going to be post-election. I, I think given the Democrats losing much a good chunk of their majority in the House. It looks like they're on the track to lose about 10 seats of their majority, if not more. There's still a few races where they're counting. Um, the Senate still up for grabs. Obviously, we've got those two, two runoffs in Georgia to get through. I, I think if you look at just how much split ticket voting there was in this election, I think it's probably reasonable to assume that the Republicans will maintain control of the Senate, um, but could go either way. Short story long, uh, I, I think now given that reduced majority in the House though, I, I think we can probably expect that 1.5 trillion is a maximum dollar amount instead of a median. Um, good news and bad news, right? The, the good news is a, a dollar, a lower dollar value means it's probably going to be much quicker to get through Congress. So we might see it, see it sooner rather than later. Bad side is of course, reduced dollar value means uh, less support for individuals, for businesses, and of course, state and local governments. So looking at the specific sectors, uh, the, the warehouse sector is thriving. And you mentioned in your forecast that there were 38 warehouses over 1 million square feet built in the first nine months of 2020. And then looking at the 2021, you forecast a strong market for this sector. 
How resilient is this, is the warehouse sector? Sure. So backing up to 2019 in terms of, of warehouse construction, that set a record in terms of our data, both in dollar value and square footage. And our data goes all the way back to, to 1967. Um, and, and we do expect it to break a record again this year and, and next. So over the short term, so through 2021, uh, and even in the year after that, I'd go even into 2022, I, I, I do think this market's fairly resilient. Online shopping is going to continue to, to gain market share over brick and mortar. Um, and if we need to think, you know, layer on to that consumer behavior and, and consumer attitudes towards shopping and, and our expectations on delivery is, is I don't want to wait a week. You know, I want my stuff now. Um, so I think the build out of these large facilities and you mentioned one million square foot, you know, there, there's been several this year that have been in the three to four million square foot per property uh, uh, range. Um, but I think you get to a point where within the next handful of years, the market gets a little bit saturated in the sense that you're going to continue to see, uh, you know, you're going to get to a point where, where the buildup of those large facilities has occurred in most ma along most major transportation routes and within, you know, a short drive to within major metropolitan areas in the country. So what happens after that? I think the market starts to shift into a more spoken hub and you get more suburban urban development of warehouses you know smaller facilities to be sure uh, for amazon and these other distributors you know it helps them satisfy that at that last mile of, of delivery um is, is the uh data center market a similar type of market to that or is that does that have more long-term potential so yeah, so great question. So data centers, we actually capture under the office market. Um, so they're not part of the warehouse market, but yeah, it's a very similar, except I would say the upside potential in terms of longevity is, is more powerful on that data center side um, as companies and as, as individuals, our data use increases exponentially. Um, with, with I, I would say virtually no limit on, on the, the amount of we want to stream and the amount of data that gets transferred just in, in a minute by minute basis across the US economy. So I'd say over the longer term, that data center market's much more resilient. So the situation for public construction is dire. And in your forecast, you quoted a, a Kroll bond ratings agency report that projects $600 billion in state and local government revenue losses in the coming fiscal year. Yet you only project a 1% drop in the value of public building starts. So how, how, how do those uh, jive? Sure, good question. Uh, so the, the, our, our public building category, just to, to cover that, that's prisons, uh, it's courthouses, it's local police and fire stations, it's armories and, and military buildings and, and whatnot. So as part of our forecast process, uh, we do include large projects that we expect to break ground. So we include those explicitly in the forecast years. And as we look into 2021, there are several um, that we expect to break ground. There, there's a, a $300 million courthouse that we expect breaking ground in, in Norristown, Pennsylvania, and a handful of similarly sized uh, projects across the country. And, and when you look at the entire category, of all the 22 that we forecast, it is on the smaller side of that. It's around a nine to $11 billion uh, per year market. So those large projects have a much, uh, a much more of an outsized influence in terms of direction of, of the forecast uh, relative to say something like a warehouse or an education sector. I, I noticed that also in, um, in airports. I mean, you, you had a, I don't remember the numbers, but the projection for the entire market seemed to be about whatever it was, the, the work at JFK was going to account for about 60% of that. that. That's pretty much it. So you, you look at our, our transportation building forecast in 2021, and it's an 11% gain, which is a pretty bold predicament or a pretty bold prediction to make given uh, where transportation is headed currently. Uh, but as you said, you know, we, we do expect those early stages of JFK to break ground in New York City in 2021. That's going to be a multi-year, multi-billion dollar project. Um, but it goes without saying that if that project were to be delayed or canceled or scaled back, that could very easily take that 11% gain and shift it to the negative. It's a, it's a very similar story with the public that it's really about a 10 to $11 billion per year market. So you take out a billion or two from, from JFK if that were to get, again, scaled back or, or canceled, and that would shift that entire market to the negative. 
Now the streets and um, bridges construction uh, sector, on the other hand, uh, is also is looking at a slight increase in activity. I think it was about one percent or so. And how much of that is due to the Fast Act extension, and how important is getting a uh, five-year transportation program in place uh, to the to the resilience of that sector? Yeah, in, in a word, critical. Um, so if we re, if we recall that the Fast Act actually expired on uh, at the end of September 2020, uh, as part of the continuing resolution that that's keeping the government open through December 11th, it extended the Fast Act um, through to the end of of September uh, 2021. So that's good news. Um, it, it did keep, however, funding flat. Um, that the funding level for fiscal year 2021 is the same as the funding level for fiscal year 2020. So that's why our forecast for streets and bridges is showing a fairly tepid uh, gain. Um, in, in terms of the importance uh, of getting that um, reauthorized, it, 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 it's, it's critical given the, the dire need of infrastructure in this country in terms of road and, and bridge work. Um, the good news though, I, I, we're optimistic. Um, that the reauthorization of the FAST Act will occur in the summer of 2021. Uh, Congress made good progress on it prior to the election. Uh, the Senate Public Works Committee released a plan in, in the spring or summer that was uh, had a unanimously, I'll say that again, the Senate Public Works <laughs> Committee unanimously approved um, their plan to reauthorize it. That was around $320 billion. The House, as part of HR2, um, or the Moving Forward Act also uh, authorized a, a, a five-year plan that would have been in excess of the FAST Act. So the good news is, is that I think the underlying support for an increase in transportation funding is there. And, and once we get into this new congressional year and, and the inauguration takes place and, and everybody has a chance to, to sit back and breathe, uh, we do think that goes forward. Uh, we're looking in terms of our forecast, we've built in $300 billion um, for just the core highway uh, portion of that or highway and bridge portion of that. Um, that's more than what's under the FAST Act. Uh, but of course that's not going to help us until we get into 2022. Um, not surprisingly, the, uh, given the state of the nation's water and wastewater infrastructure, you project a, a healthy increase in this sector. Um, how are the, uh, how do you see that being funded? So, yeah, I, I don't know if I'd use the word healthy. Um, when we look at our environmental public works category, so that's, that's the summation of um, sewer systems, water system, as well as dams and, and reclamation projects, we're looking at a 1% gain for that entire sector. Um, in terms of what drives that funding, so that's usually through the, the Corps of Engineers, uh, as well as uh, the EPA construction budget, as well as state revolving funds. And, and in general, the, um, the appropriation process has been fairly positive to that, uh, to, the, to those budgets. And when we look at what Again, between what the House and the Senate were saying just prior to the election, we're looking at funding being fairly flat to a slight positive overall um, for the EPA, for the core, and for state revolving budgets. So again, that gives us that just a little bit, just that tepid increase. Addition to that, we're also uh, looking at the two-year update to the WRDA. That's the, the Water Resource Development Act. Again, broad bipartisan support for that prior to the election in both the House and the Senate. So we think that in short order, once we get into 2021, um, that those pro that that will get uh, that will get authorized by Congress. And again, that's like an eight to nine billion dollar uh, program over two years. Um, the, the power market uh, is remarkably volatile. I, I when going back a few years, it, it, the value of starts was up 123 percent in 2019, then down 43 percent in 2020, and you forecast a 35 percent jump in 2021. Why is it so volatile? Sure. So it, it's essentially the presence, or, or I guess the absence as well, of, of these large LNG uh, import and export facilities. So those projects are measured in the billions of dollars, you know, between one and $5 billion per project. So having one of those start in a year skews the data up. It's not there the next year. It pushes it down. Um, when we look at the forecast for, for 2021, uh, FERC has approved the Federal Energy Regulatory Committee. Uh, they've approved 15 LNG facilities all in the Gulf Coast, except for one that's up in uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, again, multi-billion dollar facilities. So they've approved 15. We're expecting one or two of those will break ground 
in, in 2021. And again, you know, at a billion or a couple billion dollars each, that certainly will will cause us that that 35% gain. But I think if you if you go broader than just that LNG import and export facility of renewables, um, I think is also a growth market in the electric power sector. Um, if if you look at all electric generation starts, so coal, natural gas, nuke. Uh, solar, utility grade solar and utility grade wind. If you look at all those project starts over the last 10 years, wind and solar combined have accounted for about 60% of total generation starts. So as those markets or as those technologies become closer and closer to grid parity, where you know a kilowatt hour from one is the same as a kilowatt hour from the other, uh, that's just going to keep ramping up uh, construction efforts for those. And what about the transmission line market within the, the power market? What, what, what do you see there? Uh, it, I think they go in lockstep. Um, if, if you think about where these wind and solar projects are, they're not in midtown Manhattan um, or downtown Boston. You know, they're, they're in Wyoming and Texas and, and out west and, and generally not in populated areas. So as part of building up that renewable infrastructure, you need to build the high, uh, high speed transmission lines to get them from Wyoming or Texas into the major markets across the country. So they absolutely move in lockstep. And then finally, the uh, the office vacancy rate uh, you reported in your forecast moved higher in 55 of the 63 metropolitan markets in the third quarter. Yet you expect the market to grow in 2021. What's what's behind your optimism? Sure, I, I think there are three reasons here. Um, despite the fact that vacancy rates are moving higher, despite the fact that that COVID has has pushed us all out of our offices and into to our living rooms and, and whatnot. There will still be projects that move forward. Um, I'm personally not 100% on board with this office market is dead um, storyline. I, I think companies will continue to invest in market space and in, in office space and, and uh, Amazon has been very upfront about that. Um, there was just actually a $2 billion project that broke ground, office project that broke ground in New York just within the last couple of weeks. Um, so those projects will continue to move ahead, not to the same pace as they've done in previous years, but the office market will continue to move forward. Um, second, we do include renovation dollars in our office data. So if you think about maybe an open space office, let's uh, cubes and whatnot, let's convert that back to traditional offices. Let's improve air handling and HVAC systems that boost the dollar value as well. And as we previously discussed, we also include data centers in our office market. And, and over the past couple of years, it's ranged between 15 to 20% of total office construction. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's a, uh, an incredible growth market over the next several years. If I can just tag on to that, um, one of the other things besides the death of the office that people have talked about has been the uh, movement of people from living in cities to moving to the suburbs. Do you, do you see that as a continuing trend? Absolutely. So when you look at our residential data by county um, and you look outside of the large central metro, so like downtown Phoenix, downtown New York, uh, and out in the fringe metro or fringe areas, which are basically the suburbs or even beyond that into micropolitan areas or, or, or rural areas, um, we are starting to see that residential activity pick up significantly there. Um, that, of course, creates incredible spinoffs, right, um, for commercial construction. It'll pull some commercial construction with it. It'll be a different kind of commercial construction than we've seen, you know, less urban towers and maybe more flat, flexible space. Um, it'll pull institutional construction with it, so schools and healthcare, and it'll pull infrastructure construction with it too. You need roads, you need bridges, and you need water. So I think that movement is probably a, 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 is definitely a silver lining for the construction sector in, in, in 2021. Great. Well, thanks so much for uh, sharing your expertise with us today. Happy to do it anytime. <laughs>